This is All India Radio. In the program spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on India-Japan 2 plus 2 ministerial meeting. The participants are Skant Ranjan Tayal, former diplomat, and Sanjay Jha, journalist. In the 2 plus 2 dialogue, the two sides deliberated on ways to further expand bilateral cooperation in areas of defense and security besides taking stock of the developments in the Indo-Pacific. Ambassador, what can we expect from this addition of talk between two countries? This is a very important dialogue with a very special partner. Japan is our special strategic and global partner since 2014. And uh, we have such dialogue with very important and close strategic friends. For instance, we have a similar dialogue with United States. And U.S. and Japan both are members of Quad, where India is also a member along with Australia. And the focus of this dialogue on defense and security-related issues, the first such dialogue took place in December 9, 2019. And it was very important. And the same two ministers had uh, participated from our side. And the focus was on terrorism stability in Indo-Pacific, and of course, peace, prosperity, and progress in uh, bilaterally as well as in the region. Because what we need to note is that there is a convergence in the vision of India and Japan as far as the challenges to security and defense which are emanating in the Indo-Pacific region and they are emanating from China. China is in an expansionist mode. It is putting India under pressure in Ladakh, in Arunachal Pradesh, and across the border in Bhutan. And similarly, China is putting Japan under pressure in the East China Sea. You spoke about the security aspects of this dialogue. We have seen China's growing military capability and assertiveness on the territorial disputes and they are at the heart of the deteriorating environment of India and Japan. Beijing has sought to unilaterally alter the territorial status quo and this meeting comes at a time when Japan-China relations are facing various difficulties and Tokyo has admitted that the public opinion against China and Japan is extremely severe. We have also seen growing Chinese assertion for the eastern Ladakh to the Senkaku Islands. So both the countries are facing uh, this assertiveness of China. Yes, security-related issues where the main challenger may come from China is a central and core part of this dialogue, particularly in the context of how China tried to put extreme pressure on Taiwan just in the last month or so and has disturbed the peace and tranquility of the entire Western Pacific. And Japan, as we know, as our listeners know, has been a pacifist nation. It is a pacifist constitution after the Second World War. But it is now waking up to the threat being posed by a China, which is getting very rapidly militarized, which is expanding its blue water navy very rapidly, and Blue Water Navy is an offensive capacity. And under Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who passed away unfortunately, Japan had started to change its defense posture in three major ways. One, that it is increasing its defense spending, and they want to increase the defense spending from 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP. And Japan is also ready to assume more military responsibility by joining regional alliances. And we have seen like Malabar exercises, they are becoming more and more important and are becoming more and more strategy driven with the participation of United States and Australian Army also. Ambassador, you mentioned how Japan is recasting its national security vision in face of aggressive China. Now, that is the challenge for India. There's a deep political resistance and bureaucratic inertia against any effort to recast defense policies on Japan as well as India. But then there is so much that Delhi and Tokyo could do together in meeting their common security challenge. Yes, 
Japan has been assisting India in many ways in trying to strengthen our infrastructure, our industrial development. We also saw how this Suzuki company will be investing rupees 30,000 crore more in India. So this collaboration needs to extend also to defense industry. There has been a lot of talk about purchase of some defense equipment, some submarines from Japan, but it has not fructified. I hope that some advance takes place in getting Japanese defense industry more integrated with India's rising defense capabilities. And here the biggest assistance can come from Japan government side that they should facilitate transfer of technology from Japanese companies to Indian companies just as the Russian companies do. Russian defense manufacturers under the Russian government guidance transfer real sophisticated cutting edge technology to India, whether it is in aeroplanes or Sukhoi or nuclear submarine or even in tanks. Similarly, the Japanese government should motivate its private defense manufacturing companies to not look only at profits, but treat India as a real defense partner and transfer state-of-the-art technology to Indian companies. Japan has been invested in India right from 1958. It is the largest and the first recipient of Japanese official development assistance program. They call it ODA. And it is the most important development partners for India. So far, they have invested over 7,000 billion Japanese yen in ODA loans which in different kind of projects, I think around 310 public projects across various sectors. And we have seen Japanese financial aid has made significant headway in facilitating advancement spanning sectors of transport, water, sanitation, energy, forestry, agriculture, health, and education. So we have seen urban mobility where Japanese have been funding all our metro projects. In terms of financial relationship, in terms of investment, uh, what are the new areas they could be looking to invest into? Because India is looking for green energy, for example. Do we see more cooperation, more money coming into from Japan to India? Yes. In the transport sector, the Japanese investment has been transformational. First, the Suzuki investment in India, automobile industry and that transformed the private car scenario in India. Then, of course, the investment in Delhi Metro first, and we see in Metro now in so many other cities of India, and this Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor and other corridors that are being built and constructed, they will also transform the railway sector. Now, the next major candidate is in green energy, and we see that Suzuki's investment, which was just announced last month in the presence of the Honorable Prime Minister in Gujarat, the Suzuki company will take the lead in manufacturing electrical vehicles in India. They will invest rupees 7300 crores in a battery plant in India. And most important, Suzuki will establish a research and development center owned by itself as a company in India. And this really gels very well with Prime Minister Narendra Modi's call on 15th August that he said Jai Anusandhan, Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, Jai Vigyan, and Jai Anusandhan. He has been emphasizing that research and innovation is very important for India's development. And we see that a major Japanese company, Suzuki, which is already successful in India, is taking the lead and is making major commitments towards production of electrical vehicles in India, towards production of electrical batteries in India. And you would also know that India has not allowed import of Tesla cars, electric cars manufactured in China into India at concessional terms. So India is working very closely with our partners in Japan. This is only one example, and I am sure in the years to come, we will see many more such examples. Our Prime Minister 
had visited Japan and he followed after Japanese Prime Minister visited for the first time in four and a half years as a Prime Minister of Japan. And two leaders concurred to further develop Japan-India relations and work closely towards the realization of a free and open Indo-Pacific. So that is the synergy between two countries, the reason between two prime ministers. Where do we see this free and open Indo-Pacific relationship going on between these two countries? India's Act East policy and Japan's vision for free, open Indo-Pacific, they are two sides of the same coin and all the democratic countries in Indo-Pacific region are working together in some coordination to keep Indo-Pacific free and open. We see a lot of intelligence sharing. For instance, if the Chinese submarine go around in this area, they are tracked by American, Japanese, Australian, Indian systems. This intelligence should be shared and by satellites also the movements are shared. So there are many ways by which India and Japan can actually coordinate on the ground our defense preparedness. But again, this is a long-term objective and it is very important that India becomes militarily strong as well as economically strong. India has a very growing and major manufacturing sector. If we are moving towards Aad Nirbhar Bharat, we need foreign investment. We need foreign technology. Japan has good reserves for investment abroad. Their companies want to shift their investment from China to India, to Vietnam, to other countries. In that, again, Japanese government should encourage its companies to shift their production to India in preference to other countries. And Japanese companies normally work in close coordination with the Japanese government. And some strong signal, some assistance from Japanese government will help in this movement of capital and technology from Japan to India. Yeah, absolutely. Apart from the strategic security and economic ties, we have a very deep cultural ties between two countries. And it is believed that the first time when two countries were connected was in 6th century through Buddhism when it was introduced in Japan. Indian culture filtered through Buddhism and has had a great impact on Japanese culture. And this is a source of Japanese people's sense of closeness to India. This year, Japan will also celebrate anniversaries with seven countries of Southwest Asia, including India, and Japan has designated 2022 as Japan Southwest Asia Exchange Year with the aim of taking Japan's relations with the countries of Southeast Asia to a new height. Where do we see these cultural connections between India and Japan? The people-to-people connections are already very strong on a very important foundation, which is civilizational and is based on uh, Buddhism. And even in uh, the last century, the Rabindranath Tagore had uh, very good uh, relations and many times he visited Japan. So the Japanese people are very much aware of India's philosophy, India's civilization. And people in India are always very grateful to Japan for making it possible for uh, Nitaji Sebastian Bose to have the Indian National Army and he came up to Imphal along with the Japanese army to retake, to make India independent from the British colonial rule. So on both sides, in Japan and for people of India and in India for people of Japan, there is a special respect, regard and sense of friendship. Our defense and external ministers have their tasks cut out in Tokyo to inject substantive military content into a strategic partnership between India and Japan, for there is much that Delhi and Tokyo could do together in meeting their common security challenges and foster economic relations. Ambassador, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You were listening to a discussion on India-Japan 2 plus 2 ministerial meeting. The participants were Skant Ranjan Tayal, former diplomat, and Sanjay Jha, journalist. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR Official. You may email opinion about this program at airnsdtalks at gmail.com.